Thanks so much, um, Jason. I, this will probably put anyone ever joining the, the reading later because every now and then you get Genesis 14 and just unpronounceable names, but you did very well. Um, I wonder if you've had this um, experience as I have of um, whether you're a believer or not, you've seen up close uh, the life of a mature believer and you've seen them living in an amazing way and they're generous, they're kind, they're passionate, uh, they give of themselves, they're sacrificial, and you ask, how do they do it? How do some believers live in this wonderful, generous, sacrificial way? And for some of us, we conclude, well, they're just different. They're a different species from me. They're superhero Christians. I could never be like that. Um, or we see it and we focus on the action and we think, well, I, I can just try and copy them. Uh, I can grit my teeth, I can try and imitate their behaviour, surely that's going to do it. And inevitably that's discouraging because we've realised we can't keep that up for very long. Um, others of us have discovered, and this may be true of you if you've been for a, Christian, a Christian for some time, that a strange thing happens over time. Um, as you get to know the Lord better, as you get to know his character, as you get to rest in his promises and delight in him, you discover that very strangely, it doesn't happen all at once, but different behaviours just start to grow out of us naturally. Uh, Jesus called it like fruit growing out of a tree. It takes time, but it's definitely there. And today we're going to think a little bit about this process and examine how it is that Christians grow and change. So we're in the series in uh, the life of Abram. And um, the account of Abram, if you've been with us, is about just an ordinary guy. God picks a man, not a particularly good man. Uh, we discovered, didn't we, that he was worshipping other gods before the Lord spoke to him and intervened. Uh, but God takes this man and he gives him promises, divine promises. And as Abram, over time, over years actually, gets to know God, gets to trust God, gets to learn um, that he's trustworthy, God gradually transforms him until he becomes a different kind of person, someone who's ready to give everything in obedience to the Lord. And he does it here, actually, at the end of chapter 14, with respect to the land promise, as we're going to see. And then amazingly, at the climax of the Abraham narrative in chapter 22, uh, Abraham does it with respect to the people promise. And he's ready to give up his own son, Isaac. So let's get into um, the story. Chapter 14, it's initially quite difficult because of the names, but it's actually quite a wild ride. Um, so I'm going to try and retell it and, you know, without the, the difficult names. So basically there are um, five southern kings um, and they're listed in verse two. One of them is the king of Sodom. He's used, we need to remember him because he's going to come up a bit later. And these five southern kings are being bullied by four northern kings. They keep coming down and demanding their dinner money or they'll come and duff them up. And it's an ancient protection racket. It's been going on. It's in schools today, but it's been going on um, nationally for a long time. And after 12 years of dutifully handing over the dinner money, uh, the five southern kings finally say, well, we've had enough of this. And they decide in verse four, they're going to rebel. They're not going to have it. They're going to stand up to the bullies. And predictably enough, just like in school, the four northern bullies come down and they teach them a lesson. They try and crush this revolt. And actually, they do it in a very big way. Uh, and grand way. So on the way down to squash these rebels, for good measure, they defeat pretty much everyone they come across on the way. So this is verse 5, they, that includes the Rephaim, the Zuzim, the Emin, the Horites, then verse 7, the Amalekites, the Amorites. There's just a trail of destruction behind them. Wherever these uh, bullies go, they just wipe out what's in front of them. And they were presumably doing it because by the time they get down to Sodom and her allies, they want them to be completely isolated. They, they don't want them to have anyone they could call upon when the battle comes. And this strategy works a treat because when the bullies finally come to fight Sodom and the other rebels, we discover in verse 10, it's a complete walkover. And these five rebels flee and they fall into tar pits on the way. And it sounds like a cartoon, so I thought I'd find a cartoon of it. Um, the bullies head back home with all their plunder and um, these puny um, southern kings uh, are left in these tar pits. And, and we're, so far, we're, we're scratching our heads and we're wondering, what is this doing in the Bible? What's it doing in the Abram narrative? What has any of this got to do 
with the story so far and we you know we do well to ask that question but then uh, we discover in verse 12 that as well as making off with the loot they also make off with the lot pun intended so lot we already know he is abram's nephew and they take uh, they kidnap him they take all his stuff off and poor abram then gets sucked into this messy business he's, he's a kind guy he's a faithful family member so he decides he has to get involved and try and help his nephew. Anyway, he gets his gang together. Abram um, musters up 318 fighting men who work for him, verse 14. He happens to have trained them in warfare, just in case. It's another little um, snapshot, isn't it, into the world they lived in at that time. There was no police, no court, so everyone had their own trained militia just for these sort of moments. And verse 14, Abram goes after the four northern bully kings to try and rescue his nephew. So Abram, he's, he does this really well. He divides his gang into two teams and he sneaks up on the enemy at night time. And amazingly, Abram defeats what has until this moment been an unstoppable fighting force. And, and Abram doesn't just beat them here. He drives them completely out of the land. Verse 15. It's a little um, hint, isn't it? A little snapshot of what Joshua will do later on in Israel's his history, the conquest of the land, which will happen hundreds of years later. And verse 16, Abram retrieves not just the loot, but the lot as well, his nephew, and all the women, all the others that the bullies have kidnapped. And the whole story so far just magnifies this incredible and remarkable victory that Abram has accomplished. This is actually a big turning point in the life of Abram in terms of his fortunes uh, and in terms of his reputation and his standing in that country. He is starting at last to build a name for himself. And the immediate context of this passage, if you were with us last week, you'll remember the end of chapter 13. And um, it, we read this, didn't we, in chapter 13, verse 14. If you've got a Bible, look back. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north, south, east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. So that's the immediate context. And now by chapter 14, verse 16, not by any design, not by any planning on Abram's part, just by getting sucked into a local brawl, Abram weirdly seems well on his way to taking over the bulk of the promised land. Uh, right from the south, where the five kings were defeated, right up to Dan in the north, in verse 14. So Abram has now beaten the biggest bullies on the block. And now we are starting to think as readers, perhaps this is the moment. Perhaps by flexing his muscles just a little bit more, you know, building up his fighting force, could Abram even assert control over the whole land? Is this Abram's moment, we think. And actually, this whole situation is set up by the Lord to try and test Abraham, to try and teach him some important lessons, to help Abram grow into the man of faith that God wants him to be. Because Abram is here faced with this question. Is he going to wait for God to fulfill his promises in his time, or... Is he going to try and speed things along a little bit? Is he going to just seize through force what God hasn't yet decided to give him? That's the question Abram faces. And actually, in the story of Genesis, this is a very important question. Um, you may know, if you know the story so far, that the sin of our first parents, the sin of our first father, Adam, which plunged the world into misery, was the sin of not trusting God. Uh, and one of the way of reading those verses in chapter uh, Genesis 3 is that Adam was trying to grasp prematurely what God thought Adam wasn't yet ready for. So do you remember God said to Adam not to eat of the fruit uh, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and knowledge of good and evil we discover later in the Bible is the wisdom to make legal judgments. Uh, it's what Solomon asks the Lord for in 1 Kings 3. He says, give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may know between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? It's the same thing, it's the gift that God gives to King David as well in 2 Samuel 14. 
to help David rule over the kingdom, knowledge of good and evil. But Adam is not yet ready. He's not mature enough for this ruling gift. And God holding it back for him, Adam assumes, is God being me. God is, is just spoiling his fun, withholding a gift. And so what does Adam do? Well, we know the story. He snatches it prematurely through disobedience. And so I think this is a big question in Genesis. And I think Genesis, this question is, will Abram follow Adam's example? Will he snatch prematurely? Or will he trust God and trust God's timing? And in these uh, final verses of the chapter, God teaches Abram two crucial things which will enable Abram to wait patiently. In particular, he teaches Abram that these are the two points we're going to hit there on your handouts as well. The Lord is the true provider of every good gift, that's point one. And point two, so he can be trusted to fulfill his promises in his way. And we're going to look at each of these in turn. So let's look at the first one. The Lord is the true provider of every good gift. So let's pick up from verse 17. Uh, have a look in your Bibles or on your sheets. After his, that's Abram's return from the defeat of Kedor Loyoma and the other northern bully kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, who you remember was one of the rebels who got trounced earlier in the story. He's apparently cleaned himself up from that tar episode. And he went out to meet Abram at the valley of Shava, that is the king's valley. So this is Abram nearly home. He's had his big conquest and he meets the king of Sodom, this worldly king who wants to do a bit of negotiating with Abram. And really, as we read, the story should jump straight to verse 21, shouldn't it? We've had king of Sodom introduced. What's, what's the conversation going to be between them? So verse 21, the king of Sodom said to Abram, dot, dot, dot. But there's a little bit in between. Before we get to verse 21, there's an interruption. And it's from a mysterious priest king called Melchizedek. Melchizedek's from Salem, which is probably what came later to be called Jerusalem, you know, city of peace. And this Melchizedek is very mysterious. We don't know much else about him. He just crops up and then disappears. It seemed like he was one of the few people in Canaan who held on to knowledge of the true God in the midst of a very godless culture at that time. So let's pick up from verse 18. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed Abram and said, blessed be Abram by God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God most high who has delivered your enemies into your hand. So before Abram goes out into negotiations with the king of Sodom, God sends this mysterious messenger to Abram, and he sends him to remind him that God is the true possessor, the true owner of everything, possessor of heaven and earth even. Now this chapter has had a lot of focus on possessions, verse 11, verse 12, verse 16, and so on. But here, Abram's being reminded that whatever success he might have enjoyed, whatever possessions he might have just acquired, all that loot, all of it is only a gift from the true possessor of everything. Now, until now, God hasn't been in the narrative in chapter 14. They've just been ordinary, everyday events. Well, in that time, not today. But Abram just had this victory. He's won all this wealth. But now Melchizedek steps in to lift the veil and to show what has really been going on behind the scenes. And what he tells Abraham is all this success is God's kindness. And Abraham accepts this message as from God and he acknowledges it by verse 20, uh, giving Melchizedek a tenth of everything. And out comes the checkbook. Abram gives the first fruits of his new wealth straight back to God uh, via Melchizedek to acknowledge that it all really belongs to God anyway. It's all a gift from him. Now, um, it's, we decided this would be Giving Sunday because it's just actually all about generosity. And um, the mention of a tithe probably stimulates for some of us that question, 
of what is a tithe? Is this what Christians are called to? A tithe is when you give 10% of your income away. And sometimes Christians ask the question, is that what we're called to as Christians? Um, it's interesting. It's what definitely what believers were called to under the old covenant. Um, they were called to give 10% of their income each year. The new covenant, the New Testament, doesn't go into that uh, detail explicitly. In fact, um, when we looked at 2 Corinthians 8, and this is on the website, if you, you're interested in this topic, um, the, the emphasis of the New Testament approach is rather 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Um, and as Sam was mentioning, um, our giving is seen as an investment opportunity again and again in the New Testament. There's no suggested amount, therefore, since it's the route to further blessing. And we're free, therefore, to invest as much as we like. There's no upper limit. It's just as much as we want to be blessed, uh, which is what the Macedonians do in that passage in 2 Corinthians 9. They give even beyond their means, it says. And, and throughout the New Testament, people give different amounts. Um, Zacchaeus gives away half his wealth in one go. The widow in the temple gives everything and so on. There's no set uh, percentage. Uh, and I guess following the Old Testament, lots of people see 10% as a very good uh, starting point um, for New Testament giving, but it's not explicitly declared. So that was an aside on tithes. Uh, back to Genesis 14. Um, so in this passage, God is teaching, he's reminding Abram here that God is the true provider of every good gift. And I want to pause here and ask this question, do we believe this? Uh, one of the things that hampers our generosity is that, yes, we see needs around us, and especially if you're a Christian, you see around you the desperate need there is for the gospel, the desperate need for the growth of the church. And yet there's this nagging thought, well, you know, at the end of the day, I have trained for years. I worked very hard to get to the position I'm in right now. Surely now is the time I should be enjoying it. And actually, the Bible writers wouldn't disagree with the fact that, yes, we, we probably have worked hard. But they would ask us this, where did the opportunity for our training come from? Where did the talents come from that enabled us to progress to where we are? Where did the ability to work hard and diligently come from? So the idea of taking some credit for what we have, well done me, is actually just silly, really, when we realise that everything we have, even our gifts, even our opportunities, it's all ultimately a gift from our Father. Now, when I was growing up... Um, in the school I was in, it's a traditional school, we were taught to pray the Lord's Prayer every day in assembly. And the line I thought was irrelevant, saying it every day, was this one, give us this day our daily bread. Maybe you've had that thought. And I thought, uh, as a, a, you know, I was literally wearing short trousers, I thought, I certainly don't need to pray for bread. That is one thing I can get whenever I want from the kitchen. It always miraculously was in the kitchen. No one used the hat got there, but it was always there. <laughs> And I definitely don't need to ask God for it. But the question is, who made the grain? Who made the farmer? Who made the supermarket? Who gave our family the resources to buy that bread and put it in the kitchen? And the answer is, every step of the way, it is all God's doing. And the Lord's Prayer is so important because it rightly acknowledges our dependence on God for every stage of the process. Um, when Israel was in her infancy as a nation, if you know the story, uh, in Exodus 16, God gave her bread from heaven. Literally, uh, God caused manna to fall out of the sky. Uh, and so it was a kind of object lesson when you're young. It's pretty obvious who provides our bread. It comes from God. Uh, but when the nation entered the land, they were told to put one piece of manna into the box, into the Ark of the Covenant, and it was there as a continual reminder across all generations that whereas now they were going to be getting bread from the oven every day, it wasn't going to fall out of the sky, they were to keep that manner as a reminder that it was always from heaven, even if it had come out of the oven. It was still a gift from God. 
And that's why perhaps you do this as well as a family. We give thanks whenever we sit down to eat, like that manner in the ark. It's, it's to keep reminding ourselves every day, this is from God, it's from God. It's manna from the sky. So please do not buy into the lie. I mean, this is um, the lie that is all around us, that we live in a mechanical, impersonal universe. All there is is matter, energy, and chance. And that is the air we breathe, but it is not true. Actually, we live in a personal universe. Everything in our lives, that the air in our lungs, the, the food in our plates, everything we have is a personal gift from a kind and generous father, the possessor of heaven and earth. This is a wonderful realization if we've not made it yet. And as we start to realize this and live it out, and as we start to let this truth get hold of us, you'll notice something changes in you. And we are gradually empowered to live different kinds of lives, generous, sacrificial lives. It's all from him. And that brings us on to point two. So number one, the Lord is the true provider of every good gift. That's what God was teaching Abram through Melchizedek. And then point two, so the Lord can be trusted to fulfill his promises in his way. And next comes this strange confrontation with the king of Sodom. We've been expecting it, and at last it happens. And this king, rather than coming to Abram with thanks, uh, which is what he should do for rescuing all the people and all the plunder that got taken, or but you know perhaps coming out with a banquet to honour you know the great Abram for his wonderful um, you know heroism. That's what Melchizedek did. The king of Sodom is different. He comes to, out to Abram with a command. Look at verse twenty-one. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, "Give." That's his first word on the stage. Give. Give me the persons, but take the goods for yourself. And Abraham instinctively, he can sense something is very wrong with the king of Sodom's attitude. He's so begrudging, he's manipulative. And so, verse 22, but Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lifted my hand, that's a vow, I've lifted my hand to the Lord God, uh, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Notice there, it's very significant, he's using the same title, Melchizedek used of God, possessor of heaven and earth. He's remembering every good gift comes from him. And he says, I lift my hand to this God that I will not take a thread or a sandal strap or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing but what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, let Aina, Eshkel and Ramre take their share. So Abram's just speaking for himself. He's not going to deprive his friends who helped out in the battle. So here we see it's not just that Abram is not going to use force here to cement his dominance over the land, which we might have been expecting, but he's even going to take a hit on what would be a reasonable share of the plunder. I mean, he's the one who has risked his life and all his men to recover it. So if it works like today's, you know, the law of salvage, surely it should all be hit by rights. But Abram doesn't want any confusion that the gift of the promised land, when it eventually comes, God has promised he will give him the land. Abram doesn't want any confusion that it was a result partly of the king of Sodom's generosity rather than purely God's gift. So what does Abram do? He surrenders his rights. He's generous. And he does it in order to make it crystal clear that his trust is in God alone to fulfill his promises. And to make sure that all the glory ultimately goes to God. So wonderfully, Abram does not fall into Adam's mistake. I was actually thinking um, earlier in the service as we were um, singing about how this um, prefigures the Lord Jesus, doesn't it? Can you think of Jesus in the garden? Not in the garden, in the, uh, the wilderness and the devil tempts him just like he tempted Adam. And he promises him what was actually going to be his by right. All the kingdoms of the earth will be yours if you bow down. This is all the stuff that the Messiah had been promised. It was definitely coming to Jesus. But Jesus, why don't you just take a little shortcut, bow down to me, you can have it today. And Jesus says no. He doesn't follow Adam uh, 
Abram prefigures what the Lord Jesus will do. He will not grasp prematurely what God will give in his own time. And there's lots of outboxes to this uh, teaching. I, I actually think there'll be so many different ones of how we try and snatch prematurely what God doesn't want to give us right now. And you might be able to think of them in, in your own life. I, I thought I'd just focus in on one, which is uh, one of the outboxes of this passage is generosity. Um, what is it that holds us back from generosity with money? What is it that holds us back from generosity with time or with hospitality? And I think very often it's fear. I must hang on to my resources. This is the only protection that I have in an insecure world. That's our logic. And it's not true. We need to battle that lie. The antidote to greed is trusting the Lord, trusting his faithfulness. We see this um, explicitly in um, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. That's the command. How are we then empowered to do this? The verse continues. For God has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you see the logic there? The power to be content with less, like that uh, widow in um, in the gospel, the power to be free from money's control over us. Where does it come from? Well, it comes from knowing the Lord and knowing that he is a generous provider and he will never let us down. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Now we've hit what I think is the big punch of this passage. But before we close, there's something too exciting to ignore. And um, I want us to just share one extra um, wonderful thing that we see in this passage. We're going to zoom out and look at this passage in the light of the whole of the Bible. And we discover something else that is wonderful. And it's actually uh, another reason why we can rest in the fact that God really can be trusted to fulfill his promises. So you may know this um, mysterious Melchizedek figure. He crops up later in the Bible. Um, we did Bible studies um, in Hebrews not so long ago, so lots of us will be familiar with this. Um, and I mentioned that he functions in Genesis 14 as a messenger to Abram. But actually, did you notice when, I looked, when we looked at verse 18, he's much more than a messenger. We're explicitly told he is a king priest. And crucially, as priest, in this passage in Genesis 14, he bestows a blessing on Abram, part of the blessing that Abram has been promised in chapter 12, verse 2. This is what priests do in the Bible. Do you remember Aaron's blessing in number 6? Priests declare the Lord's blessing over people. And I mentioned when we looked a bit earlier at chapter 12, if you were with us, do you remember that episode where Abram escapes from Egypt? He escapes from Pharaoh's clutches. Uh, with lots of plunder. And uh, we talked in that passage about how Abram sums up in his life the life of Israel. So after Abram's exodus in chapter 12, what happens in chapter 13, that was last week, well, he surveys the land. So a bit like the spies survey the land in numbers. And then in this chapter, what happens? Well, Abram completes a conquest of the land, like Joshua will one day. Uh, if you know the Bible, you'll, you'll see this incredible prefiguring of the life of Israel. And in the centuries that followed, as God's people reflected on his word and the, this incredible foreshadowing, you know, Abraham encompassing the life of Israel in his life, they couldn't help noticing that at the end, the final part of this bit of the story here in chapter 14, is that there's a king of Jerusalem, a messiah. There is one who bestows a priestly blessing on the people of God. And they would have puzzled over this. And what makes it particularly strange for an Israelite is that kings and priests were very separate jobs in Israel. They're not to wear multiple hats. They have to keep separate. And I imagine it was this kind of reflection which led King David hundreds of years later to reflect uh, and he predicted then in, in Psalm 110, 
that one day there would be a divine conquering king, a Messiah, who would also be an eternal priest. And you may know the psalm. The psalm says this, the Lord has short sworn, will not change his mind. He's talking to the Messiah, the king. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this would have been a real head scratcher for God's people. How can one person be all these things? A divine conquering king who also in the psalm is a very human figure who is also an eternal priest. It's a head scratcher. What could it all mean? Until, of course, the Lord Jesus arrives and he steps onto the stage of human history and he shows that he is not just a conquering king. Do you remember he took on all those ancient enemies of evil and sickness and death and he crushed them under his feet he is the messiah the king that they've been hoping for but jesus also showed himself to be the eternal priest he managed to be the one who stands in the gap between god and humanity he's the one who through sacrifice brings eternal blessing to god's people you may know um, the final picture we're given of the risen jesus in luke's gospel in luke 24 is Jesus the priest giving a priestly blessing over his people. And suddenly, as Jesus steps onto the stage, all of it becomes clear. That's why actually Psalm 110 was the most loved psalm amongst Jesus' disciples. It's the most quoted psalm in the New Testament 22 times because it brings together all of these wonderful snapshots of Jesus' ministry in one place. The king, the priest, divine, human. And wonderfully, all of these realities are hinted at back here in Genesis 14. God just put a little clue here in Genesis 14 of this mysterious priest king, Melchizedek, so that God's people could wonder and reflect and anticipate who was to come. And all of this gives us even greater reason to conclude God will always be trustworthy. You can always know that God will keep his promises. He is a specialist. We saw last week, he always under promises and over delivers. He knows what he's doing. His plans are perfect. So we began, didn't we, by asking that question, you know, how is it that mature Christians do these wonderful, generous, sacrificial things? We wonder about it. How do they do it? And the answer is that living the Christian life, living generously, will always mean making decisions which to the outside world look mad. You know, Abram giving up his plunder, seeing the promise of the land slip further out of sight. But as we discover our God is always good, as we see that, as we remember, he's the provider of every gift. And of course, you and I, this side of the cross, we can see even more clearly how much God has provided for us, even his son. As we get to know and love this God, we discover we can trust him to fulfill his promises in his way. And we can follow Abram's example of sacrificial generosity. I'm going to leave us some time to reflect on this passage and to hear what God is saying to us in our lives. And then we'll have our prayers in a moment.